Bhagavad Gita, text 2.39 I have spoken to you of how to use wisdom in Sankhya. Now hear about wisdom in Yoga. With this wisdom, Arjuna, you will free yourself from the bondage resulting from karma. Sankhya has been explained in verses 12 through 30. Here it does not refer to the Sankhya philosophy of Kapila, one of the six darshanas of India. It is used in a generic sense in reference to the analytical study of phenomena and the introspection that sheds light on the soul. Madhusudan Saraswati says that Sankhya means that in which the reality of the Supreme Self is fully presented. Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur defines Sankhya as that which perfectly Sam explains Gya or illuminates the nature of an object. However, there is similarity between the Sankhya philosophy of Kapila and that which is introduced by Krishna in this verse. Kapila's Sankhya begins with an analysis of matter, but with the goal of discriminating between matter and spirit. Such discrimination is at the heart of what Krishna intends here by the use of the word Sankhya. Just as it is important to distinguish the word Sankhya in this verse from Kapila's philosophical system, it is also important to distinguish the word Yoga in this verse from the Yoga system of Patanjali. Both of these two schools of thought are distinct from that which Krishna teaches in the Bhagavad Gita. There is, however, considerable overlap between the systems of Patanjali and that which is considered yoga in the schools of Vedanta represented in the Gita. Later, in the Gita, the word Sankhya is associated with knowledge, jnana, while yoga is associated with karma. Jnana is further associated with renunciation and yoga with bhakti. This is how bhakti, karma and yoga are connected as if in a continuum. Yoga in this sense can be translated as engagement. It implies the positive notion of union, whereas sankhya denotes separation and discrimination, which bear negative connotations. Krishna has encouraged Arjuna to separate himself from the negativity of material identification through proper discrimination. Now he begins to encourage him to engage in the positive action of uniting himself with God. One who knows the self to be of the same nature as that of the Absolute is not bound to perform any duty. This will be further explained later. Bhagavad Gita 3.17 However, here Krishna realizes that Arjuna is not capable of assimilating knowledge of the self without undergoing actions that will purify his heart, for he is absorbed in worldly concerns, even though religious in nature. Thus he advises him to engage in yoga. Here the word yoga implies the spirit of yoga. Selfless and sacrifice, the mother of love, while action in relation to sense objects with a view to enjoy them gives rise to karmic bondage, one cannot artificially divorce oneself from action itself. Indeed, as we shall see, such artificiality in yoga is condemned. In its stead, Krishna recommends proper action in the spirit of detachment. He tells Arjuna that by acting in yoga, 
he will free himself from the bondage of karma and realize the self that is intellectually understood through the introspection involved in Sankhya. The detached spirit of this yoga was characterized in the previous verse. With the introduction of yoga in this verse, the Gita begins to speak about experiential spiritual life and practice, beginning here and extending over the next four chapters, Krishna explains gradual steps on the ladder of yoga, from the yoga of selfless action, Nishkama Karma Yoga, to the yoga of knowledge, Jnana Yoga, to the yoga of meditation, Jnana Astanga Yoga, and culminating in the yoga of love, Bhakti Yoga. From this point until the end of chapter 6, Krishna instructs Arjuna about the ideal, well-integrated, enlightened person he wants him to be. A dutiful person whose action is informed by knowledge, who realizes the fruit of such action in the form of inner wisdom and develops spiritual emotions for God, a devotee of Krishna. As this section begins, Krishna speaks covertly about bhakti and overtly about Nishkama Karma Yoga. He then informs Arjuna that at this time he is only eligible for Nishkama Karma Yoga. In this way, Krishna instructs us through Arjuna that what is achieved through Nishkama Karma Yoga is concomitant to Bhakti Yoga proper. Through the practice of the yoga of selfless action, one's heart is purified and knowledge begins to manifest. Knowledge of the self will not manifest in a heart cluttered by material attachment, and inner wisdom in which the spiritual self is realized is included within mature Bhakti Yoga. Krishna repeatedly advises Arjuna that Nishkama Karma Yoga is the best course of action for him at this time. And eventually he declares its mature stage to be synonymous with Jnana Yoga. As knowledge manifests through Nishkama Karma Yoga, one situated in knowledge becomes qualified to practice meditation. While the fruit of Nishkama Karma Yoga is knowledge of the Brahman feature of the Absolute, the focus of meditation in Jnana Yoga is the Paramatma feature of God. As one realizes this feature of God, one can progress to worship of the Bhagavan feature of the Absolute. This worship in Yoga is Bhakti, the final step on the ladder of Yoga discussed in the first six chapters of the Gita. Although Krishna advises Arjuna to practice Nishkama Karma Yoga throughout the first six chapters, he also implies that he ultimately wants Arjuna to practice Bhakti Yoga. Krishna makes this abundantly clear at the end of the sixth chapter. Krishna takes Arjuna up the ladder of yoga to illustrate the glory of Bhakti. This glory of Bhakti is twofold. Bhakti continues after one is liberated from material existence, whereas the other forms of yoga do not. Only when the heart has been purified, knowledge of the self has manifested, and one attains perfection in meditation, does mature bhakti manifest. This glory of bhakti is brought out in the Gita's first six chapters. The second glory of bhakti is the generosity and independency by which she extends herself to whomever she chooses, even those whose hearts are cluttered with material desire. Footnote 6. In the Gita, the yoga of knowledge is referred to variously as 
Sankhya Yoga, Karma Sannyasa and Jnana Yoga. The second glory of Bhakti is the generosity and independency by which she extends herself to whomever she chooses, even those whose hearts are cluttered with material desire. She does so through the medium of Krishna's realized devotees, who awaken fate in her efficacy. Those who thread the path of Bhakti as a result of her generosity will gradually develop detachment, knowledge and mental absorption in God, maturing gradually into Bhakti proper, the liberated yoga. Here, Krishna eulogizes the practice of yoga in general by stating its fruit, karma bandham grahasyasi. Vishwana Chakavarti Thakur comments that while the word yoga in this verse refers to selfless action in which the fruit of one's efforts are offered to God, a stage prior to bhakti, yoga also implies bhakti itself, considering of hearing and chanting about God. Vishma Chakavarti senses that bhakti is implied here because bhakti is both the means to transcendental life as well as continued engagement in devotional life beyond the influence of material nature. Later, in verse 45 of this chapter, Krishna implores Arjuna to attain this condition, nishtrai gunya, through the yoga practice that he is encouraging him to engage in here. 